How are we feeling back there? Oh, y'all hear me, huh? What is up? Hi, 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 hi. You guys are allowed to talk too. How about that? How are you? So good, and thank you for asking. I can't believe it. We are here at the, the end of all things, aren't we? Is this, uh, this will be the last panel for, for the weekend. Have you guys had a good time? Yes. Quite an event, right? I mean, huge, huge ups to Bobby and Lightbox for putting together probably the most amazing collection of artists I've ever seen. Right? You, could, you could probably take 200 of these artists and they'll be headlining festivals for the rest of the year. You know, unbelievable. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining us. This is the Procreate stage, of course. Um, everyone know Procreate is? Yes. I mean, after this weekend, how could you not, right? Um, this is uh, the Ideation Factory, a very aptly named title for a cool panel that we're going to do today. Um, we've got an unbelievable lineup um, here. Um, I'm sure you all know them, but I'm going to go down the list. Uh, we've got Nicholas Cole down on the end. Uh, Nicholas worked on Spyro. He's worked on Sleep Tight, the Nintendo Switch game. He has uh, uh, worked with Disney a bunch. He's done tons and tons and tons of amazing characters. Be sure to check him out if you don't know. Um, next to him is Kyle Lambert. Kyle has worked, on, uh, worked with Dark Horse Comics. He made that Procreate finger painting uh, Morgan Freeman video that went viral. Um, freelance artist ripping it. Next to him is Max Ilicki. Um, Max is also a freelance artist, has worked on a lot of end titles, worked on Ant-Man, Wasp Man, all the other bug men. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, of, of course, next to him is Rafael Lacoste, who is the art director for the franchise Assassin's Creed. Um, he's also a fantastic freelance artist himself. We'll get to talk about both of those today. And next to me is my very good buddy, Peter Hahn. Um, if you've never seen a demo of Peter Hahn, I strongly recommend you do it. It's probably the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, we did a show with him at the end of last year that had a million live viewers, and our producers from Amazon called me afterwards and were like, that was the coolest thing I've seen on the platform in two years. Um, he is the drawing wizard. Um, I don't know if we named you that, but I think uh, it should be what, how you go from now on. Um, he's, a teacher. <laughs> he's a teacher at Art Center, um, also at Brainstorm School. Um, you can find his stuff all over the place. And this is one of my favorite parts about him. He's drawing right now. Um, I've never seen Peter not drawing. The first time we met, we were at a, a huge dinner full of 10 people, and he was sitting there drawing an amazing picture while right in the conversation. Um, so we'll get to talk about that. I am Banks Boutte. I'm here from uh, Kitbash 3D. Um, anyone know Kitbash 3D? No, oh, OK, we got we got we got all right. Um, cool, so let's, let's jump into this. We're going to talk today a bit about um, where do ideas come from in a creative business? Um, Nicholas, maybe let's start with you as a, a you know what? Let's, Nick, Nicholas just did a huge, pan, or a, a huge talk on this stage. We're going to give you a, a short break. A short break. We're coming back to Kyle. Um, as a freelance artist, how do, you find, um, how do you find inspiration on a daily basis? Because there's, there's, yes, this is a creative job. This is ultra passionate. It's what everyone wants to do. But how do you make it, how do you make it work when inspiration escapes you? When it escapes me? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, or just on a, on a daily basis? Do you have a, do you have a, like a, do you have a um, discipline? A lot of the time, the inspiration is from the client, and it's very different depending on the type of project. Um, sometimes the source material, like I, I, at the moment, the majority of the work that I do is uh, illustrated posters for TV and movies. And a lot of the time, the inspiration actually comes from the movie, the TV. Um, so I often sit and I'll immerse myself in the uh, early cuts of whatever show it is. So um, with Stranger Things, for example, I get to watch the episodes early and then go through all the unit photography and immediately just looking at all that material, I know exactly what to do. Mm. So for me, I don't really sit there going, what am I going to draw today? You know, so there's often a good pool of inf inspiration right there, but then I've got to try and figure out how to form and shape that into a concept. And that just comes from my own personal taste, really. Um, if I'm in a jam, then I'll often look at my favorite movie posters favorite illustrated work sometimes that will just spark oh maybe something similar to this but and sometimes you remix things it's like I like this and maybe with this shadow and with this lighting you know um, so it's a combination of things it's off source material and then I'm really struggling with my own original concept that just lights me up I mm. actually go elsewhere and inspiration from other and you're, you're of course talking about the Stranger Things posters that you yes. do right yeah super cool stuff 
Um, let's, let's maybe, you, you brought up a really good point, throw in, jump in too far deep into the pool here. Um, let's go back to the beginning. Um, Raphael, when you were growing up, how did you get the thought that, that this might be a career for you? Ah, that's a good question, actually. Uh, I was lucky enough uh, that my parents were pretty open, you know, uh, to have an artist in the family because, mm. you know, Usually you get, um, okay, that's not going to happen, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, you have to make a living, you have to be responsible. And, you know, it's very hard to, to imagine that you can eventually make a living out of art. And I can consider that I've been, like, really lucky, even if I've been working a lot. Uh, I've been to a high school, had very good teachers, but at the same time, you have to be lucky. Mm -hmm. So it's not, like, just a given to, you know, yeah. work a lot, be extremely talented, uh, have inspiration. It's not, you know... That's not the only element you need. You need also, in the, the recipe, you need also to be really lucky. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I was unable to do anything else. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I, I really admire the people able to do different kind of jobs, uh, like even uh, just for summer. I was always fired. You know, I, I tried to work for McDonald's. <laughs> I got fired for the McDonald's. So you <laughs> could just imagine that. It's like, how can you? Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, I would also for I was selling newspaper in the train station. I got fired. Wow! Yeah, because I was always dreaming. I was you know always trying and uh -huh. you know on, on I was like newspapers. in the moon. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I think it was like oh, okay, I have to be an artist. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad it worked out. Uh -huh. We are <laughs> we are all too. <laughs> um, Max, when you were when you were um, diving in and first getting going. Was, was there a, a mentor or a teacher or perhaps your parents? Was there an inspirational figure for you? Yeah, um, I, my dad uh, is in advertising, or was. He teaches now. Cool. Um, he was always, uh, I was naturally gifted. I was always drawing from a kid. My mom tells a story that she used to have to pry crayons out of my hand when she would put me down for naps. <laughs> she would have to wait for me to fall asleep. And just, you know. um, so I was always drawing, and so that was you know, something they saw and nurtured, of course. Mm -hmm. That's pretty natural. I think of a lot of kids draw, though. Um, most kids draw. But, um, you know, I had a model for my dad as an artist, um, and it looked like a career. You know, it didn't look like it was very different from a lot of other jobs. You know, it just didn't seem like a strange, fringe thing to do. Um, so he was an early uh, influence, of course. So that was obvious. Um, but, he, you know, he, I was always, I was learning three-point perspective when my friends were, you know, doing the most basic stuff. I was doing uh master copies from uh you know from books when i was i don't know eight or something like that <laughs> um so you know i'm not that i was any good at it necessarily at the time but i was i had a model for how to get better mm -hmm. i think i think I, I was taught early how to overcome a problem and get better in a, in a meaningful way so i kind of like learned how to learn i think well um so that was big um, and I was interning at, in advertising with my dad and at other agencies stuff at 16. Um, so I was always working, and I always saw art as a career in some way. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, though, I thought art school seemed fringy. I don't know where I got that idea. I think it just seemed, I don't know, it's hard to, it's hard to picture. I was living in Ohio, so it's not like, it, it, you know, it's not like entertainment here is everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's advertising or a couple things in Ohio. So I don't know, it just seemed... Um, just if for some reason, I saw it differently. And then when I went to art school, uh, Charlotte Belland, who actually ran the Wolf, the Ambassador Wolf figure drawing thing, she was here. She was probably my most important educator, besides my father. Um, she was an incredible teacher at uh, Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio. And she was a major influence on me and kind of helped. You know, you have all these foundational skill, uh, foundational uh, classes that you take, life drawing and, you know, graphic design and all these different things. And um, nobody's really teaching, like, character design. Or, or like entertainment stuff, at least not where you know when I was there, and um, I, she was the one who helped me put it all together into one thing, mm -hmm. make me realize that I can employ all these skills in the service of one. I was studying CG animation at the time, um, which has been my career for most well until very recently. But that was she was she had a huge huge impact impact on me that way, and helped me like just coalesce all these up until then, semi-disparate skills into mm -hmm. one sort of vision that, you know, carried me through to now. Totally. Nick, uh, it's super helpful to have parents that are, that are creatives and Incredible. Stuff. Was, Incredible. Your yeah. dad was in an ad agency? Yeah, he was a create, ultimately a creative director at his agency. Now he teaches advertising at SCAD. Oh, nice. A lot of big agencies in Ohio, too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a few. Um, Nicholas, now we're on you. Um, I don't know if oh, yeah. were, were your parents creative? 
And were they were they very supportive? <laughs> yes. <laughs> can, can you tell us about um, my parents? <laughs> my parents. Uh, I hope they see this. Uh, they met. <laughs> <laughs> they met as mimes. That was one of the things they did when they were courting. They. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have video VHS tapes of my my mom putting like a full face of makeup on my dad, and then them like hopping around silently, like glum glued to a chair. Um, so, and dad is particularly mortified about this. Mom is much more embracing. So, my mom's actually an illustrator, um, and my dad was at the time a photographer, part time mime, um, <laughs> and now he's a journalist for the Associated Press. So. He's writing, she's drawing. Uh-huh. Uh, there were always like markers and colored pencils around when I was a kid. Right. Um, and so it was just. Were, uh, were you guys accurate. juggling as children? Yeah, just yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> art supplies back uh, and forth. Yeah. You know, just, uh. do, do you have siblings too? Yeah, I have a younger sister. Nice. Is she who, an artist? Uh, no, she, uh, she's a minister, actually. Um, That's funny. And the mother of two, and by all accounts, like. Was clearly the more mature and developed right. of the two she, of us. She was the wise one that came in to help <laughs> you cross. Right. Yeah. She saw me like following the mimes uh-huh. down the hill. She was like, I think I'm going to go that way. Yeah. <laughs> so good. So good. And do you, um, do you keep in regular contact with them? Do they? Do oh, they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And my mom in particular has been, she's texting me for the talk. She's like, I'm praying for you. I'm just thinking about you. Right on. She doesn't for have the, that for the talk. accent at all. <laughs> I love that for the talks, though, you know. For the talks. We're praying for you here. That's right, yeah. I know, it's, I know you're talking to that Banks boy again. And... Stressful. <laughs> um, super cool, man. And, and Peter, Mr. Peter Hahn. Um, you're going to need a mic. Um, the um, uh, inspiration for you seems to, to be never-ending, but I know it's been a very careful, meticulous process for you. Um, and I know, as, as uh, Raphael was saying, you, know, you couldn't do anything else either. Right, you you found that I've heard you say that several times. Can you talk just a little bit about um, what passion plus discipline or inspiration is for you? It's a very large question, right? Yeah, let's let's go yeah. with a, let's go with a tiny piece of it, and we'll we'll play with it. I mean, <laughs> of course, of as you were just stating from the very beginning, yeah, I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, at the age of like ten, I wanted to, to be a paleontologist. I wanted to draw dinosaurs. I thought I could go in my backyard and dig up stuff and find bones and draw animals. But of course, not realizing how difficult that would be, I gave up that dream. But I still loved dinosaurs, and nature became a huge factor of that. Uh, you know, the natural element, you know, nature, environments, creatures, animals, all the biology and science of stuff was always there because obviously in grade school and high school you go through the basic education, but <clears throat> it was also connected to the things I was entertained by. You know, things I would watch as movies or cartoons, like, oh man, that's a cool looking creature or a dragon and animals. And I would visit, you know, museums and zoos because my father was very good about, at my young age, taking me to a lot of places. Mm. And he joined the military uh, in the Army in Colorado when I was, you know, born in 81. And he immigrated from Korea in, like, 77. So he joined the Army without speaking the language, and and he got in. But once we were there, he always took me around to a lot of things. I was around the military stuff. I was around the bases, the museums, the zoos. And that was constantly being instilled. Mm-hmm. So I think that first, I think, kind of instilled a bit of discipline as a part of it. Uh, but then, of course, the, in, the, the curiosity to know more about that stuff because he wanted me to take those things. Mm-hmm. So it was all very much at the very young age where a lot of that stuff was very much established. Were those trips with a pen and paper? Well, that's the thing is that he actually drew and he did watercolor, but he never showed it to me. Never. No kidding. Uh, I found them. <laughs> Caught you, Dad. Uh, yeah. So I found sketches and stuff that he would draw, but I never knew he actually was really doing it committedly. Mm-hmm. Uh, my parents, when they immigrated, never had the chance to obviously pursue the things they wanted to. Even though they may have been inspired and they also may have been, had dreams, they never had the chance to because it was about us and the next generation. And now, obviously, now I have the chance to pursue the things I want to do. And all my family, my father's side, all had the potential, mm. absolute potential, from music to, to art to acting. Uh, but they never actually were able to do it. Um, and so that's a huge part of mm-hmm. where it definitely came from. Uh, from there, as I grew, a lot of those things were just kind of carried over, but then it was much like how Raphael was talking about his instructors, his education was all a positive experience. Mm-hmm. It just kept going from there. It was nonstop positivity from the family to the friends and education. And it, there was never a moment where I felt like I can't do it. Mm-hmm. You know? And so all those things were feeding into it. Uh, but what was the other part of the question at the end? Well, I, I think t- to that point, what yeah. a unique time and generation we are all afforded. Right. 
to to have been given the sort of safety net from the generation above us to yeah. to get to yeah. seek a creative career. Absolutely. You know, where so many before us didn't have this opportunity. Right. You know, it's a, a very unique time and place for all of us, and such a, a celebration here of that. Yeah. You know, I feel like everyone go home and call your parents and tell them you love them. Yeah. Well, I think that kind of adds to this one part I was just thinking of as all these guys were talking about. In terms of the mentorship, we always kind of isolate it to an individual or person that we mm -hmm. can look up to. But I also think of mentorship in, as a life, as in the experience with things you do. Mm. And I think a really important mentor is actually suffering, going through hardships, things that actually you can't control and life gives you as, an, a, again, a moment. And you're like, oh, my God, you know, this is a horrible experience I'm going through. And you can look at that as a negative thing, but that is a mentor of life teaching you something. Mm. And you can look at that and learn from it and really apply it to even your thought process and your work. And it can create ideas, obviously, from the stories you can tell, right? Without those experiences, you have nothing to say. Mm -hmm. That's a huge mentor, not just a person, but what you are going through as an individual. Man, I'm so with that. And I think, I think that's probably where we should just step into with this. Because I feel like success is you know, a stairway. And along that stairway are steps of failure and of things that didn't work, and of the pain, and the suffering of, shit, I didn't, I didn't hit it the way I wanted to. And if you don't go through that, you, you'd never get to the top. But yet I think, especially in, the, in Western society, we're so afraid of this dirty word called failure, and we know we don't want to talk about it, and it feels ugly, and we just post about our, our huge successes. But I think it's so important that, you know, to hear from, from a group of, of such high achievers as yourselves about some of the failure and about some of the, the suffering. Um, Raphael, do you have um, do you have some feelings? I know you're you're in such a unique position, um, leading one of the most important franchises in this space. But how does how does failure come into play, or how do you overcome that and get your get yourself back up? Yeah, I think if you really want to enjoy success, you have to be through or see. You know, you have to go through these kind of moments mm -hmm. of uh, failure. It's uh, it's really important. Uh, so yeah, it's always like uh, people feel like you have like uh, the big you know like big. Uh, protection of the franchise because like it's so huge you have like a sure. huge team you have a lot of people experimented but actually you don't see what's happening backstage it's a it's a, a huge mess it's mm -hmm. really difficult because it's a it's like a you know driving a, a, a huge uh, titanic you know you mm -hmm. can if you hit something it's it's going to take a, a huge time a long time to you know to change direction and to adjust the problems we have so we have to be extremely patient we have to be like extremely like uh, diplomatic you know with the people and uh, so it's not uh, like uh, a very quick uh, way of being creative and iterating like really fast we have to learn how to be extremely patient and iterate on very long you know mm. longer time period so it's a it's a very different way from you know being creative on a freelance you know uh, projects for instance like working on like two three weeks on something and on the other case being working on three four years on a huge factory like uh, right project, like assassin's Creed. In, in your personal it's, the mindset is completely different Right. Well, yeah. yeah. Can, can we talk about that in your yeah. the the difference? Well, what's it like in your your personal work? Where you know, because on on your personal projects, is it just you working on them? Yes. Yes. Actually, and, yeah. And so there in that domain, how do you deal? Yeah. How, how do you how do you judge yourself? How do you help yourself level up? Yeah. So I think it's really because it's there's so much inertia when you work on a huge factory like you know GTA or Assassin's Creed. Mm -hmm. You know uh, that I really need to have these moments where I can be really reactive and proactive and some stuff and. Uh, iterate on some interesting options and and choose different uh, directions and you know some personal stuff. So it's it's really cool to uh, to iterate a lot and explore um, using different kind of techniques. So I'm, it's very messy. The way I work on my personal stuff is is not. We don't have a workflow. You know when you work on your personal stuff mm -hmm. uh, as organized as it is when you work with a huge team with a lot of people. So I like to experiment different technique like using 3D first or just sketching on a on a napkin and then scan the napkin and do like uh, maybe uh, a digital painting Photoshop, but uh, using photos for the bashing mixed with some, you know, image I took during vacation. Mm -hmm. So it's like really experimentation, exploration. And I like to see the outcome of all these different techniques, but you can't really do that when you work uh, with a, a huge factory like uh, you right. know, Ubisoft, because um, then you also have the workflow depending on the, the tech we have, the new consoles, uh, the technical constraints we have for, you know, the new, way of rendering the PBR, doing the, the new lighting. Mm -hmm. So everything is very challenged by the technique and the way we have to make it fit in the real-time rendering engine. So, right. So, and with such a huge pipeline, one thing yeah, changes Yeah, exactly. The whole. That's the point. Yeah, that's the pipeline we have. And we have to reinvent the wheel because we have new technologies coming also as well. So. Right. 
So it's not like, okay, you're on this franchise for 10 years, and uh, actually, I went in the film industry, so I did a reset <laughs> during the journey. But uh, it's not like you're on franchise and you know exactly how to do things. You have to always reinvent the way of doing things because technology is changing all the time, and we also want to explore different kind of settings. In a, yeah. in a big team like that, how do you manage communication? You know, because I can imagine yeah. when one thing changes, you got to tell everyone else or else the whole, the whole train yeah. gets yeah. out of sync. How do you manage that? Uh, I think as an art director, uh, we have, if we can draw, I think that's the best solution. Because, yeah, one image is worth like uh, 20,000 words, I would mm. say. Like mm -hmm. it's really, but giving direction through examples. Uh, I have the time in conception, like during six, six months to a year, to draw and to show actual like visual examples to, to the artist. So it's, uh, and we have a small team at the beginning, so it's pretty easy to mm -hmm. iterate. But then when we come to production, right, the change can take from, a week to two months. Right. So it's pretty crazy. So we have all these reviews and uh, it's taking a long time. That's when you, you drive the, the big ship. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. In, in those... You have to anticipate a lot. So that's where experience is like really key. Yeah. yeah. And experience too comes from knowing what not to do. Yeah, right? from knowing failure. Knowing how it breaks. All, yeah. these, all these problems, yeah. So I think um, they like to work with me because uh, when I have an idea, I usually stick to the idea. I'm not kind of director, you know, changing direction all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty safe. <laughs> I, I pretty know what's working. I know the tech. I know uh, the arts. So um, it's really helpful, I think, to, to, to land mm. the project. They say great to put leaders. Put the baby to bed safely. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Because they, they say great leaders make decisions fast and are hard-pressed to change them. Yeah, and also anticipation of the problem. Right, yeah. which comes from? Yeah, experience. Yeah. Is there, um, is there a particular piece of this along the way that you remember a really hard lesson? Something that, that like really burned you that maybe took a week or a weekend to, to, to yes. see your way all the way through it? Yeah, on, on personal, like when I was doing uh, some freelance for Jupiter Ascending mm -hmm. with the Wachowski mm -hmm. sisters. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a huge, like it was a great experience, but it was a huge challenge because uh, we had to work, it was the early stage of the preconception of the, of the movie. Mm -hmm. So we had to define a visual direction for all the buildings and all the palace. They wanted something that was like really about a mix of gothic and fractal and over detail at the same time and very grandiose. So I had to use new software like Mandelbob or mixed with the mm -hmm. 3D Max and doing some like uh, hand, hand painted stuff in Photoshop. It was pretty hard to get the, the right direction. So I've, I've been doing like, I don't know, I think like so three weeks in one image. Just yeah. one single wow. image. So that's a lot of iteration. And uh, you get a bit like burned because you think about, you know, problem solving all the time. And even when you sleep, sometimes you dream about mm -hmm. problem solving. Mm -hmm. So you don't rest. It's all the time thinking about like solving problems. So that's, uh, yeah, that's really consuming your, your brain. <laughs> I, I really want to come back to what you just hit on yeah. um, in, in just a second. Um, but Kyle, let's, let's jump back to you. I know I, I threw a, a, t a tough pitch at you the first Random one. question. Yeah, 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 and then everyone else. Um, <laughs> t tell, tell us a little bit about um, first your inspiration getting into this and how you, how you wanted to, to really, um, what made you think this was the path for you? Well, I've always loved art, I've loved technology, and I've loved movies. There's always been this question for me where I would fit within that spectrum. Um, I spent a lot of time doing portraits, which is where I ended up with the Morgan Freeman type mm -hmm. portraits. I just went down this insane mission of trying to photorealism, photorealism. I want to be able to paint really realistic stuff. And then that's where I ended up. And at the end of that, I felt like I could do that. And I didn't know where to go. And at that point, I felt like story was important. I was learning about storytelling and learning about... I wanted to work at Pixar originally, and I wanted to work in like just telling stories, like moving people, not painting a single image, and that's it. Um, but I love painting portraits at the same time, and it just all of a sudden clicked one day that movie posters would be the right avenue because I could paint people. But you're also trying to tell this entire story as well, all in a single image. So that's, that was essentially my journey, and I use you know, the software as a big part of that, being able to simulate. I used to paint with oils and pencils, and I used to use all the traditional media, but now I do the same type of things, but digitally, and there's a, a lot of technical aspects to be able to do that. So I enjoy all the spectrum now. I, I, there's a lot of technology, there's a lot of creativity, there's a lot of art, and there's also, I get to sort of focus on the, the detail side of things as well. Mm. And, and for you now, um, 
you've you've achieved a, a a certain level of success, but along the way, what was what was some of the tough parts? What were some of the things that that made you think, or did you get to a spot where you're like, I don't know if I can do this. You know, I I'm I'm working on this thing and I just keep pounding away and it just won't it, it doesn't click. Mm. Um, I think every project has that stage where. Mm. Um, it comes at different stages in different projects. Early on in projects, sometimes you just you just can't get the idea right, mm -hmm. and there's just like revisions and revisions and sketches and thumbnails and adjustments. And then sometimes you fly through the beginning, you get the idea right away, and you're just realizing it. And then you struggle at the end because it's not as brilliant as you imagined it at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. So it can come at any stage. Mm -hmm. There's no sort of clear path. Um, it's interesting to, to hear you say that happens on every project. You still feel that today? Oh, absolutely, because I'm never happy with any project that I do, so there's always something. That's what's great about movie posters for me, because I'm combining so many elements, and so many portraits and vehicle mm -hmm. uh, environments, mm -hmm. all trying to be brought together into one cohesive image, and there's always one part of it that just doesn't feel right. Uh -huh. And that's great, because that just keeps me... Constantly sharp. When you're doing a poster like that, do they send you the assets? Uh, well, I get access to all the assets, and then I select the ones that I think tell the story best. Nice. And then sometimes I have to create things from scratch if they don't exist. Mm. Do you ever get a showrunner or a director who sent you a sketch and says, here's, here's the placement I'm thinking? Uh, no. No, most of the time I get brief. It's mainly just revisions that you know, mm -hmm. I get the full full blank canvas at the beginning and they just say what do you right cool so i get to respond to it initially and very very rarely do they go nope you know very rarely it's just oh we like this we like this and how about this yeah. how about this uh -huh. and it's a it's a dialogue it's collaboration between a lot of people i don't often meet all the people but i get a list of notes at the end and mm -hmm. then it's you know uh, but it's good because i don't think it's kind of like a writer needing an editor mm -hmm. i feel like if you just let loose to write whatever, it's not necessarily going to be representative of something that's been made by a lot of people. If you know, movies aren't just made by one guy. Right. And it's the same with, with the advertising. It should be a collaboration between myself and the studio and movie makers mm -hmm. uh, all in one to sort of make sure that it ticks all the various boxes. It can be a beautiful piece of art, but it also hits the marketing beats and it also tells the story that the filmmakers were trying to tell. There's an equation that Ray Dalio said that we repeat all the time about collaboration, and that's one plus one equals three. And I, I'm obsessed with that. I've, <laughs> I've been thinking in three plus one equals seven. You know, and I'm just like, that, that is it. You know, when, you, when you get the, the multitude of people, then you can build something so much greater than, than double what you would have done on your own. Isn't it refreshing to see a group of, of guys like this who have had such, such, such intense success, and you feel like, oh man, they just sit down and paint the Mona Lisa every morning. But to hear them feel like, oh man, I, I go through this every single time. You know, did anyone in here ever felt like, oh, I just don't know if I'm going to get through this? I don't know how to hit these clients' notes. I don't know how to get the thing that's in my head out into the world. Um, for every, me, every finished piece is a journey, and it's only the people that were involved that know all the mistakes and the problems along the way. Mm -hmm. But everyone sees this finished thing and it thinks it looks. Yeah. Perfect. But the only way that that final product exists, you can break apart every element of that and go, that happened because the previous thing didn't work. Right. You know. Right. And it's not just idea one finished. Right. So that's important to remember. You know, if you're struggling with a piece of work, it's because you're going to figure out that next thing that's going to make the final. And I, I love that idea one. You know, the 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 it bad pitch. You know, the it spaghetti does on the wall. Sometimes, the first but pancake. not very often. Right. Yeah. Every, every once in a while, you walk off and yeah. hit a home run. Yeah. Um, Max, do you do you feel that when you're? Um, is there a particular part of the process? You know, everyone talks about the blank page and can I just sit down and get going? Um, do you have a particular method that gets you into it? I have a lot of methods. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's funny. Like it depends on I guess if it's personal work or professional work. Um, I worked for fourteen and a half years at Elastic, mm -hmm. uh, which you know we did the Game of Thrones titles. Not me personally. Credit to the team. Um, but that's kind of what the studio is known for in Westworld titles and things. We did a lot of commercial work um, that, you, you know, um, some stuff that I love that you probably haven't seen necessarily, but we did stuff for Riot and um, Fantastic Beasts, and we did the Ant-Man and the Wasp 
man on end and stuff. Anyway, um, man on the wasp. That's what it is. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> uh, but you know, so like it depends on if it's client work um, or if it's personal work. But I guess client work, you you know, in commercials at least, we would get a lot of um, kind of a half a brief. Um, you know, you get like basic boards mm -hmm. and a director, either uh, you know the direct, like in house directors or outside or myself. And sometimes um, you'd pitch back to the client with your spin on it. So they don't usually over detail those briefs. Um, you know, they have these notes they want to hit, but it's kind of like a loose um, set of boards that you're meant to interpret and give your spin on. And so they can, you know, they have that bit out to three different directors or someone, different studios. Um, so a lot of times, you know, you're left filling in holes. I think that's really exciting. You know, it's nice to have a little bit of a boundary, I think. I think boundaries are important, whether it's personal or professional. I think that helps. If someone just says, do whatever, you know, the, the fully open pitch, it's so hard. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just a vacuum. You're just staring into the void. Um, so usually, whether it's, if, if it is professional, it's easier to color within the lines a bit and riff and, you know, play jazz around the chords they give you. Mm -hmm. um, but for my personal work, because of what I've learned for commercial, I try to give myself boundaries. I try to give myself a genre or a date or a mood to hit or... Um, Failing that, you know, if I just really need to break through a really hard, you know, um, bit of block. Um, I have a mood, uh, like an inspiration board that I go to. Um, I have interesting people online that I've seen if I just want to design a character. I've got huge just galleries and galleries and galleries of inspiration stuff. Um, it's usually somewhat generic and just sort of, you know, um, not super specific to any one piece. Because at some point, once I figure out what I'm making... I'll drill really down specifically about the thing that I'm making. And it's so rare that you just have that ready to go. But um, I think it's nice to like give yourself a couple walls and you can mm -hmm. kind of figure out mm -hmm. what the rest of the house looks like. Um, so I think, yeah, if, if, you know, failing that, like, you know, hashtag prompts are a decent way of just like getting out of your head a little bit and helping you inspire things. I use um, I've, a few times, I, I'm new to this, like book title generators mm -hmm. are interesting. Um, that's kind of a weird one because it like, has a little bit of a, um, just the slightest bit of narrative, and it's usually very open or weird or unexpected. And they're just like AI generators. They're weird, but it's that, enough that's a, to like a website. Get, yeah, it's like you can just like Google book title generators, character generators. It's rare that they're actually that clever, mm -hmm. but it might be a thing that just like gets you something. over something, and mm -hmm. and you and it gets your mind headed in a direction. Um, I, I knew a writer who would read the headlines. Yeah, that's interesting too. I think anything you can like. I think outside, some kind of spark is good, mm -hmm. um, like a catalyst for something that's going to be yours. But just like it's so easy to, just, I don't know, sit at a blank page and be like, ah, I don't know what to do. I love that idea too in personal work to to have it for the exercise to give yourself prompts yeah. and to have almost yeah. almost games that you're playing with yourself. I find it actually easier when I'm kind of brainstorming those prompts. It's easier to, I'll make a page of, I'll find a hundred ideas mm -hmm. when I'm like kind of in that mode, you know, whether it's generators or hashtags or, you know, whatever it is, it's easier to start to come up with basic, like, seeds of ideas. Mm -hmm. and I'll write them all down, put them in a document so that I can reference that later. And sometimes just having it written somewhere, it'll build in your mind. Mm -hmm. you, you know, like, and maybe two months later, you'll be like, okay, it's time to, I know where that's going now. And you just, like, sit with that. It's what kind of thing, like, where you, you know, like you are saying, you never turn off. Like, when you're sleeping, you're still working. <laughs> and sometimes you'll just wake up and it'll have crystallized without you realize it. It's just having it in your head will kind of put some cycles on. Mm -hmm. Your brain will just be working on it and chewing on it. I think that's really interesting. So like if I have an okay idea or an okay sketch, I'll just bookmark it, I'll just thumbnail it and just put it away mm -hmm. if I'm not ready to make it. And revisit. And revisit it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't know, a year ago, I revisited a sketch from like two years previous that I just wasn't ready to complete. And I, and I think I was better, it was better to wait because it got better than mm -hmm. it would have been if I had done it then. You know, you just have better skills yeah. or just you've sat with the idea for a while. I think that's interesting. I do too. Yeah. Um, Peter, you um, have put out a series of books um, or, or a number of different books, not in a single series. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, just recently, congratulations, by the way, The Blacksmith just came out. Yeah, my graphic novel. First yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, yeah. yeah. Right? It was years to make. It took years. It t talk about that a little bit. Where did the, where did the first piece of that come from, and, well, then, and did you know you were going to make a comic book? Well, even before it? that, you know, kind of coming off of the previous comment about 
waiting to come back to the piece that you may have done and kind of putting it to the side, revisiting it, is uh, something I have done myself. So one of the first projects from Comic-Con in San Diego, 2008, was my first experience. And some of you guys that were in my talk on Friday, I kind of mentioned my working method of how I did social media. And I wanted to develop my first sketchbook for Comic-Con and my first show. So I said, well, okay, I'm going to go through a bunch of random sketches and put it together. But it didn't catch people. There was no real, uh, not, nothing of myself in terms of story or ideas. It was just random sketching. So it had no clear intention. So the next year, I came back because people kept looking at these sketches that I had done for fun. And I did them mainly because I found the sketch I had done two years prior. I said, these are kind of cool sketches. I like these characters. I'm going to make something out of it. So I just drew more of them. And so everyone kept giving me feedback. It's like, oh, this is really cool. Can we buy it? Can we buy it? So then I made a book of those characters the following year at Comic-Con. And I then produced that first book that's actually a little bit more controlled and clear and defined based on uh, the story or the world or the, the style, potentially. Mm -hmm. From there, every single book afterwards uh, used that same kind of formula where I was looking for inspiration from others, but feedback as well, too. As I put it out there, I was waiting for some, it's like fishing, mm -hmm. putting out a lot of lines, right? And feeling that pull. Uh, but for the graphic novel now that just came out, what, a couple months ago, I mean, I began that project in 2014, per se, because that character, that, that world was born on Instagram, actually. So I would actually... Again, throw out work, post it on social media, and everyone would say, oh, this is really cool. Like, you should make a comic of this. This is something I really want to buy and get. And so based on that response and feedback, I then capitalized on it and then built the world. And eventually, more people requested, I need a comic. I want to read this stuff. Now, in my position, I've never done comics before. And I'm more of a designer. I can't write. So I was, like, afraid. Like, I don't think I can do this. I'm going to fail at that for sure. And I knew it. But I turned to people, my friends, to help. Like, hey, tell me, how should I do this? Give me the ideas. Give me inspiration. But every single one of them would be like, you've got to also just do it yourself. Just sit and just problem solve it. So I sat and drew and wrote at the same time. Thumbnailed the entire thing. I spent months doing it, and then I thumbnailed it three times over. Uh, once with writing, a second time with finding out camera, a third time to figure out the uh, panels and the pacing, and then I went straight to the pages. This book took me two years to make. And... From the idea to the writing to the drawing to the color, packaging, distribution, and social media, I did everything myself. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those situations where, again, the, the people out there was what really helped me give me the ideas of where I can take the character and what they really wanted from me. Mm -hmm. So I was using social media to a positive advantage of, of what it's supposed to be for, right? A community right. of people. <laughs> Instead of like trying to get likes or only trying to get comments. I'm right. using that as data information to take the next steps afterwards to produce something. It's such a, a great time to, we, we talk all the time about minimum viable products yeah. and how do you get something to market. Because right. it's so easy to stay in your bedroom drawing your thing over and over again and do a thousand drafts that oh, yeah. your third draft might have ripped. Sure, you know? absolutely. And I think with, with social media now, you can actually connect to an audience, get real-time feedback, yeah. and see if there's something there that sticks for other people. And I think it's important that you do put your stuff out there a little bit, yourself, that is, but even your work. I know there's always those comments of like, but I'm afraid to show it because somebody might steal it. Well, you right. can trademark it, you can copyright it and put it out there, but you know what? Somebody can always still just still steal it and copy mm -hmm. it, right? Uh, it's always going to be a, a situation like that. Um, but if you don't put it out there, then you have not, no information and you're only secluded by yourself and you get tunnel vision. And you wait and you wait and you wait and you think, okay, when it's good enough, I'm going to release it. When mm -hmm. it's good enough, I'll share it. Right. But you'll never feel that you're good enough. You've got to get it out there and grow with the people. And that, that feeling of, I'm worried that someone's going to take my idea. Of course. Yeah. Is, is, do you agree with this, that it stemmed from... I'm worried I may not make something good again. Sure, absolutely. Do you think that's the one thing that's going to be the key mm -hmm. to get you to the whatever success that you want or the, you know, the famous reputation that you want to get to? Right. Yeah. I feel like the first time you get ripped off is like, oh, you made it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Some, someone, <laughs> someone liked your shit so much that they right. want to be, be like you. Sure, you sure. Know, I feel like that's, oh, now you're in. Yeah, you know, yeah. And then make something else. Of course. And that's a natural response, I think, because you care about the thing you're developing mm -hmm. and you want other people to care about it also. But I think that's why I, I really stuck to that of sharing the work because not only do I care about it, but I also care about people's opinions. Mm -hmm. I care about people's responses. I'm making it not for myself, but for others too. Mm -hmm. I want to share the world. I want to share my ideas. Mm -hmm. So if I just kept it to myself, and yeah, I can make it the best of my ability, and I'll make another project, and it's all for me and me. But uh, that's the whole reason why I create and draw in the first place because that's why I teach. Mm -hmm. I want to inspire. I want to give. It's not just for me. It's not about me. 
That is so apparent in everything I know about you. Yeah. <laughs> I, see that, I see that all day long in the way that you connect, how often you're out connecting with people, how much you want to help people. I think yeah. it's, it's a, a real joy to, to be a part of and to be around you for that. Cool, thank you. Um, Raphael, can we talk a little bit about some of your personal projects? Yes, for is, sure. Is, yeah, are you, are you comfortable with that? Yeah. Um, what, what are some of those and what, how do you, what, what are you focused on there? So uh, I've been working uh, on a few personal stuff, coming back from, you know, the, leaving all this technical, uh, you know, rendering and all the path I had through matte painting and all this technology. I wanted to have a step back and go back to the roots, actually, uh, mm. back to the basics. Mm -hmm. So I've been uh, drawing a lot, sketching a lot uh, lately, I would say, like, uh, since, like, 2006. Mm. Went back to, to traditional drawing, sketching on paper. And I think it's really cool because you get this uh, natural connection with the, with the actual physical, you know, connection with the paper mm -hmm. being. Uh, and you get also to to describe and understand when you work with reference to understand more how things are working. Yeah. And I think it's it's almost like taking notes. I would say like when you write down notes. I think when you when you have all these uh, overwhelming technology behind you know your desk and all these uh, 3D softwares and uh, all these options you can have even in Photoshop, for instance, mm -hmm. um, you you can have a step back from all these layer of technology and just focus on you know but it's something that is interesting and understanding how things work and how, how actually your ideas are. Mm -hmm. so I think it's a better connection with the brain. So yeah, I did uh, this uh, Lions art book. Uh, I sold it like yesterday. Uh -huh. I sold that. Nice. But um, Sorry, it was, yeah, it, it was really cool to work on that. So it's self-published. I worked on that, you know, every weekend. Mm -hmm. I was traveling, taking notes also, taking photos, <coughs> my camera and uh, grabbing ideas from the actual photos to bring to life something. In, in a natural that's a, a, a big part of of your creative expression too isn't it Ta taking photos and yeah, sharing those photos, photos yeah. and putting them so out yeah photo I'm packs. coming from the I have a fine art background in, in photography so mm -hmm. I, I've been working with a theater company um, uh, I did a lot of personal also uh, work on, mm -hmm. on photography, some exhibitions and some stuff like that uh, so yeah I, I didn't make a living through photography but uh, it, it's still there it's still a background and I think it's Really helping me to uh, to learn how composition, but also lighting is working. Right, and uh, that's uh, I'm really glad I had this time, you know, working. For, but even in fine arts now, you don't really learn how to draw. Mm -hmm. You learn how to talk. Mm -hmm. So I was like a bit uh, ah disappointed by by the school and the and the actual teachers. So I, I took the time to learn how to use a camera and develop my photos. So. What a great thing in this absolute digital age to spend some time with analog tools yeah yeah you're right yeah. you know and understand what a, what a real camera does yeah you know and then everything everything gets better because of that right yeah yeah and i think there's also uh, when you, you take a lot of photos and you draw at the same time you get this inspiration from your pictures you're taking but mm -hmm. also the pictures you're taking are also inspired by the art you're making so mm -hmm. when you travel if you have the opportunity to travel if you're lucky enough to travel in a place you can really pick uh, you take pictures and you choose the lights maybe because you like to try this kind of environment, you like to pick this kind of mood. So I've been doing also lately some long exposure to choose this kind of interesting um, details in the shade. So you get these values you can't really see with the eyes, but the camera would, would see that through the long time exposure. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like making a new expression. Like you take really the time, have the tripod, put the camera. I had this very old... Uh, Mechanical camera with the digital back, so I, have, I like this process of you know taking the time of you know taking the picture, of making my focus, and making everything like manually, and then taking mm -hmm. the time to print the image. You know, back. what so, a, so. what an amazing thing to get to call work, right? You know, where it's mm -hmm. it's your you're traveling and you're you're yeah. seeking other hobbies and passions that also mm -hmm. feed into the thing that pays the bills. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, I think. Y you don't have to travel very far, just going outside and taking the time to discover what's happening around you, you know. You spend so much time. Yeah. Yeah, because you, you spend so much time, you know, in the office or, right. you know, in your place, in your home. Uh, but being curious about the light outside and just, it could be going like, you know, two, two blocks away, signally, mm -hmm. and staying like for this light that is just before the night where you get this artificial lights, but also the light from the, from the sky, mm -hmm. uh, getting interesting values and, you know, Maybe coming back at a different time of day and uh, get inspiration from actually the real it right. around you. And I think inspiration is not something that is, uh, it's not a gift. It's not, uh, oh, you're so, you know, so, so talented, you, you're so in inspired all the time. No, it's, it's a question of work and curiosity, spending time outside and talking to people as well. Mm -hmm. That's why I like Lightbox, it's amazing. Right. There, there's a line, um, I love to be interesting, be interested. 
And yeah. I think if you want to to dive into it, if you want to understand, you really have to. You, if you want to have a voice, you really have to take in. You yeah, know, you have to yeah. listen to with with all and of your senses. If you're losing inspiration, just talk with people, uh -huh. and you get new like a new field of inspiration. Yeah, I think. And you were talking about like clients. I think it's really interesting that sometimes inspiration is also coming from through uh, the actual the brief, and uh -huh. you do something that you would have never done. Mm -hmm. I worked on, on this uh, book cover uh, for uh, the Wind Up Girl. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, had Jeremy Lassen uh, giving me some direction for that, and I was feeling. I had a brief. I had like a, a text, and it was like, "Man, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do," and I was really honest about that. Like he hired me, and then I said, "No, I have no idea." <laughs> what right. do you want? And he came back like, "Usually we don't do that, but okay for you." <laughs> so he did like a, a terrible photo bash something with some lines into it. It's like like a kid's drawing, mm -hmm. and then you have to bring that to life. And it was amazing because everything was there. I had this kind of uh, market, shanty town market with a huge elephant in the middle, and have this uh, yeah kind of a steampunk city in the mm -hmm. background. Everything was there. I had all this information, so it was bringing to life. It was really inspirational. But like the photo bash was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, so I have kids. Uh, I have a boy. He's like you know, girl. She's twelve, and. She told me one day, oh, Raf, you should do a forest of giant mushrooms. The kind of idea, you know, I would have uh -huh. this kind of ideas. And uh, it came out, like, really good. It was really cool to work. Kids, are, <laughs> kids are unbelievable so for cool. inspiration. Yeah. Um, Mr. Cole, as, as you um, are, are going through it, um, when you find you're at an at a impasse, do you find it helpful to step away? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think one of the ways I like to talk about it um, often is: uh, Do you know the movie Kiki's Delivery Service? I I don't. You don't? Okay. But does anyone? It's a Ghibli movie. Yeah, you guys come, know this one. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's about a, a witch, and and uh, she's just coming of age, and she's moving to this big city, and and coming into her own, and as a person as well as sort of in the fiction of the story, um, and right at this ultimate sort of moment of of tension and, and joy and it almost seems like things are going to work out uh, but something sort of bad happens and she loses touch with her power um, and she can't make anything, she can't fly on a broom she can't do anything she used to do um, and right at that moment she meets this uh, woman along the road that she encountered before, they hadn't connected before but now suddenly they like form this connection uh, and the woman's a painter and it's kind of the filmmaker I've always felt like talking through this woman to students and to people uh, me, <laughs> you know, like uh, in the position of, of feeling like, where did it go? You know, like, why, <laughs> why can't I make it work anymore? You know? Um, and the advice that she gives is su such gracious, like sort of generous advice. It's like, take breaks, you know, stop trying, you know, it's like mm. go for a walk and, and take the focus and the pressure off of trying to force yourself to be what you're not right now, you know, and, and, and learn because I was talking to somebody else on the showroom floor today and we, we talked about uh, they had contacted me years ago um, and things had progressed but they said but the dreams changed and now I'm, I'm doing something else you know now I'm doing environment art I, I thought initially I was going to do character stuff or such a small change but it could feel massive um, and it should change I think you know I think change is, is the correct answer to growth um, and um, as you begin to develop as an artist you shouldn't necessarily want the exact same thing the same way that you were at 14 um you know when you're 32 and you're doing this professionally and uh i talk a lot too about like the purity of that state of like when you're a kid trying to go back and remember why you got into this to begin with and it's really important but i think that as i say that i'm realizing that i'm also propagating this idea that we need to remain in that state as, as a 14 year old or a seven year old or, you know, and I don't think that's actually true. I think that we need to remember that the people that we're making art for are often in that state still. Mm. Um, and that to connect and to empathize with people, we need to remember our past experiences, but they don't have to be our present. Um, I love that change is the correct answer to growth. Make a meme out of that. <laughs> Um, it's so it's so true, isn't it? That we we get so tied up in this thought of what we're supposed to be, and we're on, on a deadline, and by X number of years in, I'm going to be here, and and we forget that along the career, life happens. 
And that in that process, you have to, you know, there's an equation that I love. I'm, I guess I'm obsessed with equations that aren't really equations. Um, but it's uh, stress plus rest equals growth. And I think for, for hyperachievers, um, I think the rest part is usually pretty tough. It's usually pretty tough to, to say, I'm going to stop for a moment. But that's what that stress is telling you, you know, like in mm -hmm. exercise or whatever, like stress is telling you something's broken. Like if there's pain, you know, you need to stop mm -hmm. lifting that thing that way, you know, and the rest is the only way that that's going to heal correctly so that you can move forward in strength and building muscle. This is a weird metaphor for me to get into, but I am not <laughs> that guy, but uh, you know, it is still about like tearing muscle apart and allowing it to heal and then tearing it again and allowing it to heal. So it's just, an inherent part of the kind of growth we have, we experience all the time. I think it's a perfect metaphor, and I, th I think I think that that the tearing and and filling in with new stuff and and rebuilding from that is what growth is of any kind. And I think that you know, I mean, there's so many stories of like the guy who broke the the mile time took the week off before the before he stopped training for a week, you know, and came in with so much energy because he had rested. And I think that's that's such a, a hard thing. Do you do you find? Well, I think that's yeah. part of what. Oh, let's mic you. Let's mic you for the recordings. Which is, which is being able to listen to yourself, listen to your body, listen to others. You know, as you have conversations, it's easy to just talk and say and think things and always trying to solve. But that listening aspect is actually a very difficult lesson to learn. Also, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I'm not saying you have to shut your mouth and just you know, pay attention, but you know, being aware. Mm -hmm. The awareness, I think, is very important. And I think, as I said in the very beginning, nature was a part of inspiration, but I was also being aware of me listening to nature. Mm. Like, it's saying something to me. It could be, honestly, I would sit there and, and look at trees and a breeze of wind would go by. And going off of Miyazaki, I just love that scene in Totoro where they're flying in the air, but they're invisible. And they're just gusts of wind. And people around them can't see them, but they see the wind going through. I mean, that kind of awareness of something can be happening, beautiful, but they're not aware of it, you know? I love that aspect of being able to listen uh, intently of the of the even just the immediate things right across from you, but the amazing vantage of things that are outside too, mm -hmm. uh, and and having that kind of ear, but eye and then heart to open to, is I think one of the hardest things to go for because you're so intent on trying to say something, you know, mm -hmm. and trying to whatever it is in creation or products or whatever the case is, but even the piece of paper you're working on is saying something to you as well. The, the material you're using is saying something to you. The sound that it makes is saying something to mm -hmm. you. It can sound in a way it doesn't really feel comfortable, and the, the drawing that you might make may not come out the way you feel is good because mm -hmm. it just didn't sound right. Mm. I mean, I've had that with even the, the iPad. I would draw on the iPad. <laughs> I hate that glass, okay? I would draw on it, and it squeaks, and it's very subtle. But that squeak was just like, ugh, I don't like it. So I bought that screen cover on top, and it sounds like paper. It's like, oh, yeah, mm. that's, that's the feeling. That's mm. the thing. And so I'm able to now create with more ease. I feel more comfortable going into it. But that's that listening mm -hmm. aspect I feel is something that's not talked enough about either. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think to further the sports analogy, I think it's Michael Jordan says the heart of a champion is connectivity. I use that all the time because I used to work out intently. Like uh, after Art Center, I was very frail. Art Center will either uh, you'll gain a lot of weight or you'll lose a lot of weight. Okay. And I'm, <laughs> I'm a small guy. And I came out of Art Center, I weighed about 100 pounds. I was wow. a bone. Okay, that was it. All I ate was <laughs> bread and ice cream, like whatever I could buy. <laughs> and then obviously cups of ramen. For four or five years, that's all we did. So we come out of there frail, broken, literally. And so in <laughs> 2005 and six, I started working. I began working out more. Mm -hmm. And for, what, 10 years, I really pushed my body to a level I never thought I could do things. Last couple of years, I've kind of relaxed on that because I'm so busy, but that analogy makes complete sense to me. Because mm -hmm. then you, again, do have to really pay attention to when something hurts, yeah, don't do it. <laughs> you know, uh, do something else, strengthen that muscle, because then you start to realize the parts that you do have to strengthen by listening to it. And for me, I realized it wasn't about the muscle, it was the joints. You know, mm. it wasn't about lifting heavy, it was about lifting light and more. You know? mm. So then it strengthened my joints, which then can support the muscles, and the muscle can then grow. So many artists, I feel like, talk about like twenty-minute spurts, and if you can you know, set a timer and live only in that, and then take a break, and then come back, you're able to to give yourself that that feedback loop of well, hey, I, have, I can get in and out. Yeah, I use that as an advice for students. I say use timers, but it's not a start and end point. It's a start and checkpoint. Mm. You start your timer ten minutes. You stop. You look at it. Step back and ask yourself questions. What is my intention? What am I trying to do? What am I going with this? Set another ten minutes and draw. Mm. 
then keep going and step back again. Mm -hmm. Look at it. Ask questions. Step far away. Look at it from a distance. Don't just get your nose in there, you know? Yeah. The timers are great. Um, I want to open this up because um, the audience is being very interactive already, and I want, I want to make sure you guys get um, your questions in. Um, so track them. I want to just cover one more topic. Um, it's, such a, it's been a repeating theme for me this whole weekend. In the digital era that we all seem to inhabit, um, and being you know, some of the, one of the forefront industries in the world of, in virtual space, it's interesting how many people are talking about getting time away from screens. You know, and Raphael was talking about the paper, Peter Hahn's got the paper here. But I think it's, it's more and more recurring that people are shutting off their phones at night or trying to get away from the screen. Um, do you guys feel that? What's, how does that, how does that ex explore in your life? Um, I took a uh, uh, fine art boot camp last year for eight days mm -hmm. at Watts Atelier just to get back to something kind of, I don't know, core. Tangible, yeah. Tangible. Um, I, I, I always loved doing figure drawing stuff at school and everything else, and hadn't really done much in oils since art school. I mean, a little bit, but not as much as I wanted. Um, and I just felt rusty and um, self-conscious about um, something I really loved and, and kind of letting it gather dust. And so I, I took eight days and just drew and painted for nine hours a day. Mm. Uh, it beat the hell out of me, but it was great, and it was like, you know, it, for when you're feeling rusty, it was like a hell of a way to <laughs> blow off those cobwebs. But it was really nice, and it kind of put me back in touch with um, study again in, in kind of a more foregone way, which was mm -hmm. really nice. I want to do it again. Um, I think uh, that's like being able to push around actual physical paint and you mm -hmm. and watch someone who's really skilled. Um, I think you know, it's it, in art school. Look, nothing against. CCAD, but you know, like Ernie was my painting teacher, and Ernie was fine. But Ernie's not Watts Atelier, and Ernie's not like uh, um, like a world class painter. And I think if we can check in and take um, classes with people who are at the top of their craft, like they are at Watts Atelier and, uh, and other, there's some you know, a bunch of other great places. But to see it in person, to ask questions of why are you making that choice, and just to see how they handle the brush, I don't know. There's something about um, getting in touch with physical stuff that was really, really helpful. And, I, and it was also out of town. It was in, near San Diego. And so I got to travel a little bit and be outside my usual comfort zone and you know, kind of by the beach, not that you had the time because it was nine hours a day. Mm -hmm. But it was just, there's something about changing the channel. And I think um, variety is, is a key component to creativity. Yeah. Um, and so if you have just the same routine every day, you're just going to make the same kind of stuff. And I think that's why I love about Procreate particularly is it gets me out of the house. And for me, like I, I have a Cintiq at home that just gathers dust. It feels like work to me when I sit at it. Um, but on the iPad, I go to coffee shops. I'll sit on the couch, uh, kitchen island where I have a little bit of a view or just go to bars, whatever it is. I think taking it and working someplace novel or working with a weird brush or any of these things like, or, you know, I, I like a parallel pen. I, there's like a really chunky, crazy, like half inch parallel pen that I like to draw with sometimes that just makes you like, it's a problem to be solved, and it's hard to make a careful mark with it because it's just it's an unwieldy thing. Things like that make you think differently and make you be more present with um, problem solving in real time and being creative. And it's almost like sculpting with that kind of brush. Mm. It's really interesting. I think any of that like variety stuff, anything you can get do to get out of your your groove is helpful. Um, but I think like changing the location was a really big thing, and, and working traditionally is is also yeah. You, of course, make Max Packs, which are some of the, the main brushes used in Procreate. Um, a thought that, that came to me, you're so good at coming up with, with fun ways or exercises to get in. Have you ever put out challenges for others to do? It's funny. I've just been thinking about that this weekend a lot. Um, it's funny. A, a lot of people, I, I love these, you know, I love making brushes and everything. I think they're important. They're a good tool. I think tools are important, but they're not everything. Um, process is important. And I think you can make, if you know what you're doing, you can, your process can, you can use the worst brush in the world to make a great painting. Mm. Um, and I think people can maybe hold up brushes as, as a shortcut to making good art. And I want to mm. make sure that people don't think of it that way. So I was thinking about um, doing, uh, I, I have tutorials coming cool. for people to help use the brushes and, and just to help get them out of their usual way of using them. Um, I like to try to work, so I have a gouache pack. I like to try to use the, the media in a way that replicates roughly, you know, and I'm, I'm not, I'll cheat if it feels right. 
um, but try to work. I did a, a study of 12 Angry Men. Uh, I was watching that film recently. I just loved the, the tone of these guys. And I tried to work in a way that felt like an editorial illustration from the time period. Just as a way of kind of like marinating in the, um, I don't know, the headspace. And I thought it was kind of a cool like method painting kind of thing. Just felt right. And I really liked that experience a lot. Um, Lois Van Barl actually uh, picked up on it and saw the process we were talking about a little bit. And she tried it too. And it's just funny. So that made me think. I was like, I want to give some of those things out. Like, here's an approach to painting. What can you do with this approach? Because it's just yeah. like, it's like inspired by a classical like editorial thing. Right. Or, you know, what about a Grisaille underpainting challenge? Or what about a, you know, whatever it might be. Um, you know, I don't want to make it too complicated and fine artsy. But like, right. I think it's nice to like check in on why you're making the marks you are, the order of the things, the order of your decisions and why. Um, if you, like I said, it's a process thing. I try to change it up a lot. And part of it is because I have to make samples to sell my brushes. Um, but it, it's been really good for my, uh, creativity because I think like it, I have a lot of arrows in my quiver now and I think that's been really fun um, and it keeps things fresh but it also means it's hard to like know what the hell to paint and how to paint it when I sit down because I have so many different techniques at play that I'm like I don't know what my thing is anymore but I think that's good I, I you know so I want to try to put some of those challenges out there I'm not sure how to do it yet but I'm, I'm trying to think of a good structure for it yeah perfect um, all right ladies and gents what do you guys got Who's got one? Question. Perfect. We can keep going. <laughs> Come on. Someone's got to have a question. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to repeat the question just for the, for the mics. So the question is, um, you guys obviously are very experienced. What advice do you have for um, some of the more junior people coming in who are doing um, perhaps more mundane projects than, than ultra exciting? Did I get it right? All right. I have a quick thing to say about that. Um, over the course of my career, I've, I've been uh, a junior artist. Like I was at Elastic for 14 and a half years, so I saw the whole range of the place when I quit as an art director and director. Um, but I was a junior artist when I started. And my personal, I, I was not great about making personal work for a while. Um, but, you know, a handful of years back, I, I made sure to make it a, a deliberate practice to make something for myself because I was, it's hard to, when you're, especially if you're working, uh, when you're building a career, it's really easy, especially as artists. I think we pour so much of ourselves and take so much of our personal um, pride in the work that we do that it's easy to kind of lay it, just leave it all in the field and not leave any for yourself. Um, and so, you know, when you're coming home and you're tired and you're, you know, demoralized, we've all been there. And it's important to, like, I, I made a point to do something a week. I used a hashtag event to get me out of my rut. Uh, Sketch dailies at the time was a, was hel helping me just make something, um, and it didn't matter what it was or how to do it, but it felt like I was part of a community, and that helps. Having a little bit of support is cool, um, but I noticed that professionally, my my personal work is a reaction to my professional work. So when my professional work, I was in C I was like a CG lighter and modeler, and all about hardcore detail, very like analytical, um, detail oriented, like just super. Um, Oh man, it was just, it was exhausting and kind of like a lot of brain power chewing on that stuff, right? Um, and so when I would come home, I would sketch. I would be loose. I would do the opposite of that. So I would just be loose and expressive and doodly. And it, it was, there was no pressure to do anything important, but I would make sure that I was doing something for myself. Um, over the course of my career, and that, like now as an art director, I wasn't on the box as much. I wasn't on, the, I wasn't necessarily painting every day or lighting scenes every day or whatever it is. And so I had more energy to, I have more and more desire to make a fully fledged piece of work, more like illustra illustrative, like environments, storytelling, fully fledged characters. And part of that also comes from I think my skills got better, um, and I had better ideas for how to tell a story better. Um, but I think, I think that's a good thing to like check in, like see, like have a compliment to what you're struggling with. Do the opposite. Change the channel. I think just having variety in your life is good. If you're doing detail work at work, don't do detail work at home necessarily, or at least do it occasionally. Um, it, you don't want to like, you know, like I said, variety is good. But I think that that's the way I, I seem to solve it for myself. I just want to follow up on that really quick. I think that um, like the, those periods where things like are really draining and kind of a grind um, often are kind of the pain that we were just talking about, that kind of like frustration that is going to bear fruit like in the future, you just can't see it yet. I spent like uh, a large portion of my first job um, 
which I thought like, oh, I'm going to be a character concept artist. And that was kind of how they hired me initially right out of school. And I thought, this is it. Um, and I, they started to run out of work and the senior guys got fed first, you know, and the junior guys and the more junior you went, the further down the pipeline, you know, it, it was like, we got to find something for this kid to do. Um, and I showed some aptitude with sculpture, with, with, uh, hairstyles, uh, shocking. Um, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I started to sculpt and skip ZBrush, and and they saw that, and they started to sort of <laughs> they were like, we have a whole MMORPG of hairstyles, and we need you to do all of them. <laughs> and so I spent like four or five months of my my work time, um, just day in day out sculpting just the hair in ZBrush, just the beards, just the facial hair of an orc versus a dwarf versus an elf, and I had to make that interesting enough for myself, and there was an opportunity there to. Uh, to do what Max was talking about, where like you, you, that that challenge wakes your mind up a little bit, maybe because you're so frustrated, you're looking for like there's got to be a way to make this like bearable, and so I'm gonna make this elf hairstyle as cool as possible. I'm gonna make these dwarves like I'm gonna put cool stuff in their beard, and there's gonna be, um, and so there was that was one thing is finding those like silver lining kind of coping mechanisms in there, and then later like I, once I emerged. It's almost frustrating, you know. I ate my vegetables, and like, my gosh, like, you know, I was healthier for it. You know, like, I knew more about volume. I could turn shapes in space. You know, I understood how hair works and flows, and uh, and now that can, you know, bear fruit in my illustration work that I enjoy more now. Let me just add to that real quickly. I mean, what you just did, you were also projecting a really strong, positive image of you in the studio mm -hmm. that makes you people want to work with you now. You can approach something as mundane as that and make it exciting, you know? You could treat it as just work if you want to. And your first job, you might only get, oh, design a door. You know, like, you got to design these little facades for a building and architecture. You got to sit there and do it. And if you come into work the next day, you might still have that mindset. You know, you can go home and try to adjust and relax and that kind of thing. But then you got to go to work again, right? So if you don't change that environment for you, making it something very positive and fun, then no one's going to do it for you, right? So I think what Nicholas is talking about is really the key. And I find that that person of who you are and how you make that work exciting will also then affect others around you and be like, man, you did such a great job on that. Try this one out now. Right? Mm -hmm. I'd suggest as well, like using the early projects as an opportunity to really hone your skills and really like get everything polished to the point where you get a, an amazing project come along and you're ready, you know? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the time, I know a lot of artists who struggle with their techniques and they're struggling with it whilst dealing with a brief at the same time. And, and you know, they're like, oh, what brush should I use? And blah, blah, blah. You want to be at the point where you know what your favorite brushes are, you know what your techniques are. You've done so many pieces where you're just ready for that project when it comes along. So that's what I would say is use those early opportunities to just practice your techniques and just, you know, just get comfortable and luck only ready. works if you're prepared right yeah yeah you know it's, it's like practicing for the, the big race you right know? so the that's what i would the idea of of a positive can you make a tough situation positive especially for a young artist i think couldn't be valued higher you know R Raphael, when you're hiring or when you're thinking about promoting or when you're um thinking about letting go of artists um, how important is their attitude and their, their positivity? Yeah, that's, that's key. Right? Yeah. That's, that's very simple. <laughs> I mean, is it, do you find that, that you, with, with the right kind of personality, you'd be willing to invest more in that person and teach them something new just to keep yeah. them around? That's, yeah. Actually, you can have someone like super talented, but if you don't have the, uh, the actual attitude, mm -hmm. uh, it's very tough to, to work. When you work on a big project, you have to be, you have to be, uh, like really, uh, Good with the team you know you mm -hmm. have to be like a team player you have to be open to feedback you mm -hmm. have to be inspiring also you have uh, to be very patient because when you start for sure you will have the the best opportunities to work on you know, the most interesting designs maybe at the beginning but if you're patient enough maybe it's going to come and mm -hmm. if i feel that the like the person is not patient it's, uh, it's not good, it's not it, good. It, it'll ruin the team yeah yeah it's not good and um I would say like attitude is really something like because it's, it could be like really viral when you have like someone with a str strong personality and like negative mm -hmm. aura, you know. Right. It can spread really f very fast, very quick. And um, you, I love uh, when I have juniors who are like 
really like really into it and really you know, dedicated and uh, mm -hmm. have fun. You, you feel like they're really happy to come to work and they, they, they take the feedback very positively. You know, they, they take that as iteration and how to grow. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's really key. Yeah. Our, important. our game studio and parent company is We Are Fuzzy. And mm -hmm. our number one question when considering a candidate is, are they fuzzy? Uh, yeah, and, and if they're not, it doesn't matter how uh, good they are because they won't they won't fit in. They'll bring the whole place down. And one one tough negative seed in the room is is uh, contagious. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I had some some juniors. Uh, they had like this attitude and uh, you know always complaining, mm -hmm. but like super talented at the same mm -hmm. time. So sometimes you can find a balance because uh -huh. they're so talented. You can <laughs> put them off in the corner. Yeah, yeah. But it's uh, it's time consuming, yeah. Uh -huh. But you know, as an art director, you're not just giving direction; you're also like a therapist sometimes. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. Um, one other small piece of advice I heard yesterday um, from Ben Morrow um, was, uh, you you'll be hired to do the job you've proven that you can do, and it's very it's very rare within your studio that they're going to come to you and say, "Hey, we need you to draw the the lead character," um, when you've never but you've never proven to them that you can. But what he spent a lot of time doing was at night he'd go home and do the thing that he wanted to do, and then he'd come in and just put it on his desk, you know. And then then all of a sudden someone walks by and goes, "Holy shit! I didn't know you could do this." And they're like, "Do you want to draw the wolves in the Hobbit?" And he's like, "Yes, yes, I do." Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. <clears throat> right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know you gotta you gotta you gotta put in the time. And and when you're young, you're not gonna be given the shit that you want out the gate. And no, none of these. No one here got there because someone was like, ooh, we just so believe in you. You know, it, it's hours and hours and years of the, the midnight oil and making it work. But if you care and if you want a job like this, because this is one of the most competitive industries in the world, if you want to be up on a stage like this and having careers like this and all the things that come with it, you have to be willing to sacrifice some of your weekends, some of your late nights and some of the tough things and do it when you don't want to do it. You know? Yes, hi. Yeah. Oh, j jump on it, jump on it. Sorry. I'll be quick. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I think habituation is a big deal. Um, I, there's a, there's a, something that got me back into my work. Like I said, I was working weekly, like making sure I was working to a schedule for myself. Um, I think there's a lot riding on each drawing if you don't draw enough or if you don't practice your craft enough. So every time you sit down, if it's been a month between between now and the last time you did something for yourself or longer, there's so much writing, so much pressure um, in making the thing. And so, like, if it doesn't 100% go the way you want, you're rusty. You, you haven't set up the conditions to make yourself succeed. And so when you don't necessarily succeed, it's going to crush you and it's going to demoralize you for the next time and you're going to wait another few months to make a thing again. That's a terrible cycle to be in. And it's really self-defeating and it's easy to fall into and I was in it um, and so when I started doing that weekly thing I think so making a habit of working more often and means that it each drawing doesn't have to be super important to you it's the act of doing it and so and over the course of time you're gonna you're gonna feel some successes and you're gonna have some failures but you'll start to like connect the dots between the successes more and it'll come more easily because you'll be working you'll have a continuity of thought you'll have more ideas that you'll be more inspired. Um, that was really the key to me. If I if I can work every few days at least, or definitely you know a week at minimum, I have the the pressure's not on. If I if I fail, it's fine. I'm doing it next week. It doesn't matter. Um, that's a big deal. I think that's helped me in the past. So habituation is like the thing that I would say. Um, it takes the pressure off. It just means that you're. It's just it's just a checkbox, right? And if it looks great, great. And if it doesn't. That's so what you got the next one coming up soon. I would just uh, look at your old work, see how far you've come already. Is um, pretty much every time you do a piece of artwork, you're learning, something. you're failing something, and that 
failure makes you go, next time I'm not going to do that. And just remember that thought that you have every time you do something wrong, you are going to do something better next time. It might not be very visible in the next piece or in the next piece, but every time you fail, you kind of build, it's the same what we were talking earlier, but you know, you then look at your work from a year ago and there should be progression. It might not be immediate, um, but you know, I feel like sometimes I do a piece of work and it's the best thing you'll ever do. And then, you know, you look back at it seven years later and it's like, I'm so far. So it, a lot of it's just like looking back at, your, at yourself and realizing there is progression. Aiming high, you know, if you aim really, really high and then you don't quite make that, you've still progressed. That's what I've always done. I've always tried to be the best. Aim for the, to be the best in the world. And then you might not be the best in the world, but you've progressed in that Herculean task. You've gone and become much more. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I would just add, I think that to both of that, those are like the bigger picture, like vision concept. And um, for me, when it comes to patience, um, apropos of the hair thing, um, finding those little like nuggets along the way, like just falling in love with the process, getting obsessed with the process. Because I was obsessed with the results. And we were talking with somebody else about um, who you're hiring. I won't name names, but some companies only like to hire fans, you know? And they only like to work with people who are already fans of their work. And what the sometimes you'll get is people who are obsessed with the brand. You know, that's what they're passionate about. You say you want to hire for passion, but when they're all really passionate about the brand, not it. They have to be passionate about their process. They have to be passionate about the craft. Uh, and that's a whole different paradigm. You know, to just be in love with the end result, in love with like, you know, ooh, this couch feels good. You know, like I can't <laughs> wait to sit on this one. You know, like that's that's not you know, the, the path forward, I think, you know, to be excited. And, and for me, I used to have a process that was like, I'd finish the line, like a comic book uh, penciler and then a comic book inker, I would finish the inks and then I would color it to perfection and it ended up dead on arrival. You know, like the end results felt stiff. Um, and I also was very impatient through the entire process and I got really bored. And I think leaving questions unanswered all through the process so that it's not done until it's actually done like you haven't answered all the questions about the piece until the piece is finished. Um, I think that that's been huge for me too. I think I'd also find people that are, will tell you honestly uh -huh. about your work is great. You know, I love people that will go, what about this? You know, cause it's, it, I do that to myself constantly. I'm constantly like, I'm a bit different than most people. I'm so self-critical and very like very harsh on myself and, it's some people don't find that productive, but I do because I'm I'm constantly like looking for stuff and oh that's not great and I, I basically spend ninety nine percent of my day going that's not good that's not good that's not good that's not good and then essentially by the end of it there's only a tiny few things that are still bothering me because I've just worked through it success and and I I just critique my work constantly and why constantly asking myself why am I why is this not great why is this not great why is this not great and if you do that constantly, things gradually get better. And, and if you've got other people that can do that too, that aren't going to go, oh, well, that's amazing. Uh, I've not even finished it yet. Like, you know, I, I want people that have the same critique level of myself. And that's hard to find because my parents will love everything I right. paint and, my, you know, my friends. And sometimes the clients are like that. Sometimes they're like, oh, it's great. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I've only been doing it for an hour. Like, I've still got like 20. A lot of my work sometimes will look quite finished early on, and it's it's just you know days and days and days of detail work. I'm the, I'm often only the person that will mm -hmm. see what it still needs to be. So I think finding ways to critique the work and just be ambitious, you know, uh, that's not always what people tell you, but I, I think for well, me it's, it's worked a lot. Being able to receive genuine constructive criticism is something I think early Enjoy on. Enjoy it. Is you know, to, I love it when take, people yeah. give me criticism. It's right. like, this is an opportunity to make the work better. Yeah. It's great. The, there's a through line for just about every successful person that I know. And it's something that I think is lost on, on my generation, the, the younger generation than me, which is we typically want to have done it more than we want to do it. And I think if you're going to seek a, a, a field like this one, the successful people I know want to ride the wave. They want the third quarter. They want the hard part. 
They want the thing that gets difficult in the moment that you get to find yourself within something, not to showcase it. And showcasing it's fun. Everyone likes the movie premiere. But the, the, the job, the reason you get paid, the reason you will be something is because you are in it. And I, I love this line my partner always says, the goal is not to finish. The goal is not to win the championship. The goal is to keep playing. I love that idea. If that, if that can be what you're, you're seeking is to get to do one more, that would be a very high level of success. Ira Glass has a quote about taste and the fact that we as young people got into this business because we have taste. And what a great gift. The problem with taste is often your work won't live up to it, especially not in the beginning. But if you can weigh through that, if you can weather that storm, and you can put in the hours, and you can get honest feedback, and you can receive it and seek and ask of yourself every day, what could I be doing better? How can I continually improve? And that's one of my favorite things about hanging out with guys like this, is they all talk about how they're getting better today. Today. All of them. And they will sell you the same thing tomorrow. There's a thing that the Navy SEALs do when they're in the middle of Hell Week, they teach the guys. Because Hell Week is, is one of the hardest things in the world. You know, to most, most people in the the tiniest sliver of, of society can pass this, and they're trying to get to the end. They're trying to get through seven days of, of staying up all night, being sprayed with hoses, and you know, carrying, uh, what the fuck you call them, uh, big boats over their heads. But what, they, what they, they teach them to do is focus on the next step. And then they have this thing called irrational optimism, where they're going to tell themselves in their head that they're doing great, even though they're eating shit. Right? And when you're in the middle of something really hard where you feel like you're going to break, that voice, if you can summon it within you, and you're like, hey, this sucks, but yet I'm going to still do it, I'm going to finish, is a very powerful thing. And then you'll find you can go probably 40%, it's a random number, but you can go a lot more than what you thought. You can push yourself harder. And to get to this level, you got to love it and you got to push yourself. And suck it up when you suck. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yes. I forgot. I'm supposed to repeat the questions. So the, the, the question is, um, how do you deal with a, a negative seed in your group? Collective burnout. When, when, the, when the group is really struggling, how do you, how do you maintain um, and thinking about this from a production standpoint? Can I hop in on that really quick? Anytime. Wow, there's a big problem with some of this stuff. Um, and I, we are, are all, <laughs> some, of, <laughs> some of my friends here are intimidatingly driven and, and ambitious. And, um, and we internalize critique and pain as an opportunity to grow. Sometimes pain means something is broken. Sometimes pain means something is wrong. <laughs> you know? And it's not always just on you or on your individual team. Um, your positive attitude isn't going to fix what's inherently wrong with certain parts of the industry. Your positive attitude is not going to fix predatory crunch practices by capitalists at the top of this thing that just want to take advantage of your enthusiasm. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and break character a little bit and say like collective bargaining is like a pretty incredible tool for people in position like that. Um, there are ways that we as artists can say, no, I'm sorry, this is like, it's hard. I want it to be hard. I want critique. I want this to be difficult to achieve, but I, I have to go home. <laughs> you know, I have to have a life. I have to have friends and a family. There's a reason we're doing this and it's not, you know, its own end. You know, it's, it's, uh, we're trying to give back. Uh, and in order to give back, you have to have something to give. And, um, yeah, sorry, I was rant, but I hear that and I get real fired up. <laughs> I, I, killed the room. <laughs> I, so I didn't realize um, this has been so much fun, but we're over time. Oh, um, how about that? Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for joining us. Spending your last bits of Lightbox. <laughs> Nicholas Cole, Kyle Lambert, Max Alicki, Raphael Lacoste, Peter Hahn, and I am Banks Boutet.